Uh, thank you, Saul. Um, thanks for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be back here at BIF. Um, and it's an honor to be asked to open the proceedings. Um, my story is a bit about transformation. It's about transformation of myself. It's a personal story about my journey from being a British diplomat working for a government to a belief and becoming an anarchist. Uh, it's a journey from a belief in governments as the most powerful and correct force to order our world to a belief in people in an agent-led approach to um, creating change and arbitrating our common business together. The story begins when I was a child. Um, I was fascinated by international affairs. I read uh, a large newspaper from front to back every day. I joined the British Diplomatic Service in 1989 the year of revolutions. Um, I served in various places, including Germany, Norway, uh, Kabul after the invasion, some other places. I worked on the Middle East, the Israel-Palestine dispute. I was for a while speechwriter to, in fact, two British foreign secretaries, the second of whom fired me because he didn't like the speeches I wrote. Um, the zenith of my career um, took place in New York City. I didn't know it was the zenith of my career at that time. I thought my career was going to go on for the rest of my professional life. Uh, my job in New York was to head the Middle East section of the United Kingdom mission to the United Nations, dealing with negotiations at the UN Security Council on all aspects of the Middle East as they occurred at the UN, including things like the uh, attempt to get the Lockerbie accused to trial from Libya, uh, the Israel-Palestine dispute, the occupied Western Sahara. But above all, my responsibilities covered Iraq and the UN's demand that Iraq uh, disarm itself of its weapons of mass destruction. Uh, part of my work involved intense day and night negotiations on Security Council resolutions. Part of my work involved policy consultations within the very small British team who dealt with Iraq and with our US allies with whom we worked very closely. I attended several um, US-UK bilateral meetings, as they're known, o over the four and a half years of my job. And in all of those meetings, we said the same thing. Uh, the policy is working. This began in 1998. It went on till mid-2002. The policy is working. Our policy of containment is stopping Iraq from rearming of uh, its weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Iraq poses no threat. This was the emphatic assessment from analysis of our intelligence, which I took part in as well. So I was uh, a little surprised, to say the least, when our governments, mine and the US government, uh, began claiming something different in advance of the 2003 invasion, that Iraq was a threat. Um, I was horrified. I wrote various letters to the head of my foreign service um, offering my resignation. I'm afraid to say I didn't send them. I was too afraid. But eventually, in 2004, those of us who worked on Iraq were invited to offer testimony to the first official inquiry into the use of intelligence on WMD before the 03 invasion. I sent testimony in, in secret, in fact. Um, I'd arranged to testify in secret with the inquiry saying that the UK and US had exaggerated the threat, that we had avoided, ignored alternatives to war, and in fact, that the war was illegal. And when I sent the testimony in, I realized in some deep part of my soul that I had no choice but to leave, to resign. I didn't really expect to do this. I had no thought of what might follow. I had no idea. So this was really, as you can imagine, something of a professional crisis for me. Um, what was I to do? with my life. I had expected to be a diplomat, uh, an official diplomat, for the rest of my professional life. What I eventually came up with was something called Independent Diplomat, which is the world's first ever advisory group for democratic governments, um, countries, and political groups around the world, advising them on how to do their diplomacy better, how to get their peoples to the table where their fate is decided. We've advised, advised Kosovo on their independence, South Sudan, maybe Scotland one day, various other, uh, various other countries and um, ignored groups, including the people of the Western Sahara around the world. It's amazing work. We now have a network of offices around the world. Um, but the crisis was not only professional when I left the Foreign Service, it was also a deeper um, 
existential but also political crisis. I had always been fascinated about how the world works, how does it run, what keeps it going, what creates order, if you like. And as a government servant, naturally, I had believed that it was governments populated by nice, decent, rational people like me who ran the world correctly, who would ensure order, who would ensure that our common problems were solved. But when I took a deep breath and actually moved away from government and sat back and looked at the world, it was not order that I saw, but something rather the opposite. Um, Globalisation had thrown up various very severe problems, climate change, um, financial volatility that seems to continue unabated, um, endless war, um, growing inequality in almost every society and every economy. These problems were getting worse. They still are getting worse. They are severe. I didn't see governments offering solutions. Why was this not working, I wondered. And I set myself to try to answer that task and began writing a book, which one of... Um, a former Biff colleague gladly, I'm very glad to say, helped me with, and she's here, and I want to thank her. Melissa, thank you for your help with that. Um, anyway, uh, that book attempts to answer that question. Um, and one of the answers it comes up with, there are several answers, is that governments, in a sense, are the wrong category from the way the world is. There is a kind of category mismatch. Governments are for a world that is more ordered, that operates logically, where they can track events and pull a lever and produce a sequence of events to produce a particular outcome. Of course, the world today particularly doesn't work like that. It is not a chessboard. It is a Jackson Pollock painting. It is not chaos, but it is not ordered. It is something in between, and that something in between is a complex system. It is billions of actors uh, interacting constantly producing constant change amongst them. Um, no government adequately can track that, can know what is accurately, can accurately know what is going on in that complex system. None of us can. Um, and any student of complex systems knows that it is impossible for top-down authority to produce order in such a system. In fact, their efforts may be counterproductive, as perhaps we're seeing today. Order emerges in a complex system from the bottom up. It emerges from the combined actions of those billions of actors, agents. Change is produced by agents, individual agents operating on their own or in groups, can produce change across the system thanks to the incredible interconnectedness of that system, which, of course, globalization has produced. So this is one reason why governments are not working. What might work instead? Well, um, the analysis of what is wrong leads one to a prognosis about what might work, which is, of course, agent-led change. Agents being the most dynamic and effective source of effect, of cause and effect. Agents are, of course, people. It is people-led change. Um, it is us. What does that look like in practice? Well, if you take two realms of the conventional socio-political order, capitalism, democracy, politics and economics. There are examples in both the political realm and the economic realm which show us what change might look like and indeed already does look like in some places. Compare our ossified, stultified, corrupted politics in Washington DC with a city like Porto Alegre in Brazil where they practice participatory democracy, where 50,000 people a year take part in decisions to decide how the city's budget is spent. Um, they debate how schools, hospitals, roads, sanitation are allocated, are paid for. Because everybody takes part in the decisions, naturally the outcomes are fairer. There is a greater and fairer distribution of these services between the favelas in the periphery and the richer center. The World Bank did a study of this city several years after participatory democracy began and found that the outcomes were significantly better. The system was less corrupt because its decision-making was transparent. Partisan politics had all, had all but disappeared because people wanted to work together on their common problems. The um, distribution of, the, uh, of uh, 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 welfare across the city had dramatically improved. 
So that's one example. This can be implemented. It is feasible. It is not chaos. Um, these types of participatory self-organized systems um, can work. And indeed, across America today, in various small towns, and indeed in neighborhoods of New York City, where I live, participatory budgeting is just beginning. We can do this. It can happen if we demand it. In the economy, the company is, of course, the primary unit of the economy. And if we can change the company, maybe we can change the whole economy. And here the contrast is between a company like Walmart, which epitomizes many of the things, not all the things, but many of the things that are worst about the contemporary economy. The family that owns Walmart is, has a wealth equivalent to something like 40 million of the poorest Americans put together. It is a place where workers are paid minimum wage, often the lowest they possibly can paid, and are denied workers' rights. What might be better? Well, in Britain, and I'm not making this comparison in a British-American way, there are many things wrong with uh, my country, and I love this one. But in Britain, there is a store called John Lewis, also in the retail sector, which is a cooperative. It is owned by its workers, who are called partners, not employees. It was turned over by its owner um, to its employees 100 years ago. Uh, it is a highly successful company in the most competitive, one of the most competitive sectors of the modern economy, retail. It is a name known to every British person um, for service, good value. It is profitable year on year, highly profitable. Its workers enjoy the benefits of the company. They enjoy agency, this feeling of control that we so lack in our contemporary experience of the modern workplace and indeed the modern political system. None of us feels we have real control. The partners of John Lewis have agency. They get to elect who runs the company. They decide the broader policies of the company. They have long holidays. They enjoy often large annual bonuses. There is a network of leisure centers around the country for John Lewis employees, including uh, sailing clubs and hotels. Uh, funnily enough, the partners in that company are happier than average. These systems are possible. They are available, but only if we choose to take them. The onus is from the authority to whom we have looked for results to us. It is a fundamental psychological as well as political and economic change. Um, so I think from this journey, you can see a sort of logical sequence. It wasn't of course, logical to me at the time. It was a rather messy and uncomfortable and untidy process. The book took me five years and many, many drafts, most of which were terrible, to prepare. But it is, um, to my mind, an evidence-based analysis where I've looked at what works and what doesn't, looked at the numbers, looked at the statistics, and it's pretty clear to me what the solution might be. An agent-led system um, goes by many names. Uh, it is a people-based system, it is horizontal, it is not top-down, it is self-organized. Uh, and one of the names that it can go by is a very gentle form of anarchism. Thank you very much.